I have um, I have a couple of goals for this talk, and um, you know, and I I'm gonna spend maybe five seven minutes just talking, but I'm happy to get interruptions along the way, even during those five seven minutes. But I want to set up a couple of I think big picture issues around the U.S. healthcare system, and what are the sort of big big, big issues that I think about as a, as a practicing physician who studies health care and tries to figure out how to make the healthcare system work better. Um, I will be honest with you that the first few minutes of it will hopefully leave you a little bit depressed about the state of the healthcare system in the U.S. And it is, um, and for anybody who has had, I, mean, I think if you've ever had an interaction with the healthcare system, which I would assume most people have at one point or another, if you're interested in this part of the economy, which is about one-sixth of the entire economy, um, there are some very sobering numbers about where things are today in 2008. Um, and then I'm gonna talk a little, very little bit about, and I have lots more data that I can get into if people are interested. I don't wanna sort of um, lead with that, but I can get into some of the big efforts that people are trying to do to try to make the system work better. And, uh, and with, the, with the sort of goal in all of this, that I think a major underlying problem of the healthcare system is the lack of transparency, the lack of good information management. And my hope is that from the sort of folks in the, in the room, and again, interrupt me along the way, ask me questions, but we can sort of generate ideas. I'll tell you, my, my honest, my goal for being here is to get ideas and input and, and insights about how the heck we begin to make the system work a little bit better. So a um, couple of the sort of big picture uh, take home points. I actually counted all those zeros. They're correct. We spend $2.1 trillion uh, on healthcare. That's how much we spent in 2006. I think by anybody's account, $2.1 trillion is a lot of money. Uh, it's about one out of every $6 of the entire economy goes to healthcare. Um, it's going to get to about one in $5 of the economy in the next decade. And just because $2.1 trillion is not a number anybody can understand, um, it comes out to about $7,000 per person. And if you think about it, a minimum wage worker makes about $11,000 a year. So if a person who works full-time making minimum wage can spend about 65% of their pre-tax dollars and buy health care for themselves. Um, so it's sort of this idea that we're spending unbelievable amounts of money on health care. Questions or thoughts or disagreements on that? Seems like a lot of money, right? <laughs> It's two million million dollars. <laughs> and then you sort of ask the question, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but you say, how do we compare to everybody else in the world? And if you look at other high income countries, uh, no one else is close in terms of GDP, percent of GDP, in terms of the fraction of our economy that goes to healthcare. You have France and Germany and Switzerland get to about 10 or 11 or 12 percent. We're at about 16 and a half and climbing. Um, so we spend much more than anybody else, both in terms of absolute dollar amounts as well as in fraction of our economy. So we're well ahead of the game. And the question is, what do we get for all of this? <clears throat> and here, what I wanted to do, and this is the sort of most, hopefully the most painful part of the talk. I'm going to spend about two minutes talking about the RAND Health Quality Study, just to give you a feel for why most people, when they look at the healthcare system closely, will say, I'm not sure we're getting the value that we want out of for $2.1 trillion. So let me tell you about the RAND study. Um, most of you guys know the RAND Institute. It's this really terrific health, well, it's a, it's a policy think tank. They do health, they do defense, they do a lot of other stuff. They're pretty nonpartisan. And they did a huge study that came out in 2003 that asked the question, how good is care in America? When you go to a doctor, you go to the hospital, how good is care? And part of it depends on what do you mean how good is care? How do you define good? And they came up with 439 indicators of healthcare quality. So let me tell you what these things are. Uh, and then, as I said, I will, um, soon after this and the next couple of slides, I will stop talking and I'd love to hear um, ideas from people. So these indicators of, of healthcare quality are evidence based practices. What do I mean by that? I mean examples like I develop chest pain, I go to the emergency room, I'm diagnosed with a heart attack. We know that in the first 24 hours of your heart attack, if someone gives you a beta blocker, you have about a 25% lower chance of dying in the first 24 hours, and you have much greater long-term survival. 
And beta blockers are basically cheap as water. I mean, they cost about a nickel each. Um, so it's the kind of thing that you would think would get done 100% of the times. We've known for 25 years these things are extremely effective. So they came up with 439 such things across the entire healthcare system, from preventive care to chronic disease, diabetes, heart disease, to inpatient stuff, stuff that happens in the hospital. And, um, and then they did a, a pretty comprehensive look across 12 metropolitan areas across the US. And what they found was that we were getting it right about 55% of the times. So these are not controversial things. These are not things that are where there's a lot of subtlety involved. This is stuff that like you get 10 doctors in a room and hopefully all 10 say, yeah, that's a no brainer. You got to do that. And then you look to see how often does it actually get done. And the answer is 55% of the times. Um, this is a paper they published in the New England Journal uh, about 45 years ago now, um, suggesting that the care that we get is pretty inadequate. Um, is this something that people, do you guys, I mean, I, you know, one of the things I'm sort of always interested in is the question of, is this surprising? Do you, did you know this already? Is your sense that healthcare, the quality of healthcare is pretty good? I'd love to hear people's reactions to, to what I've said so far. I mean, I think most people know that healthcare is pretty expensive. Why don't we start? Yeah, go ahead. They break it down by health insurance costs or rates? Or geography. Yeah. So those are terrific questions. And we know from lots of other studies that there are huge differences by race and ethnicity, et cetera. I don't have the slide here, but the surprise, the one surprise of this study was that if you looked at white, educated, uh, high-income people, that 54.9% was about 58%. And if you were black and poor and uneducated, it was about 51%. So yeah, there's a racial difference. But no one looks at 58% and says, boy, that's terrific. Um, so, you know, so instead of getting it right about five out of 10 times, you're not getting it right about six out of 10 times. It makes me feel a little better, but it still feels a little inadequate. So yeah, so there, there aren't, there were surprisingly small differences by race and ethnicity in this study. There are other studies that have shown big differences by education, economics, etc. Yeah. Do you know the reasons behind it? I'm wondering if the doctors know, know the uh, problem, but uh, maybe concerned of superficial loss or something. Right. Uh, that's a really good question, and there have been lots of other studies that have tried to look at this. When you ask doctors on these different types of indicators, should you do this every time, they say yes. Do you know the evidence behind it, they say yes. If you ask them, do you do it regularly, they say absolutely. And then when you actually look to see if they do it, you get numbers like this, or lower, or slightly higher. So there's a disconnect between what doctors think they do and what they actually do. So it's not being driven by a fear that if I do the right thing, it'll cause malpractice, um, lawsuits, or, or any of that stuff. Some of that can explain three, four, five percent differences. It's not going to get you to down to fifty-five percent. Yeah. Uh, I pay a lot of attention to this, and I think when you present it the way you do, it it leads people to believe that one doctor is doing this knowingly. And the, the recent paper in the New England Journal two weeks ago and lots of others basically explained this by saying that there's seven people on average in the case of Medicare patients involved in the care. And the reason that it's not getting done is because six, no two doctors know what the other six are doing. Right. And so are there... Yeah, so let me be very clear when I show this number overall, when I say that it doesn't matter whether you're white or black or rich or poor or educated or uneducated, it, it's sort of under, the, uh, the argument behind it is, you know, and I'm a practicing physician, and if you did this for my data, I mean, I feel like I'm a pretty good doc, I work, I'm sure I'm not, maybe I'm, a, I mean, I'd like to believe I'm a little better than that, but maybe I'm not. So the point is, it's not about individual physicians at all. It is completely about the system. And, and we'll talk uh, more about that. Let me um, just finish up the, the last slide that sort of should add to a little bit of misery and depression about the healthcare system. So you've, now we spent, we're spending $2.1 trillion. We're getting it right about 55% of the times. But then there's this other thing, which is when we admit patients to the hospital, about one out of 10 times patients suffer a significant injury from medical care. 
So not only do we not do the right things 40, 50 percent of the times, but we do something that's harmful to people about 10 percent of the times in the hospital setting, about half of which are wholly preventable things. What kind of things am I talking about? I'm talking about you come in for a heart attack and you develop an infection due to a catheter that somebody put in, or you develop a pneumonia in the hospital that had nothing to do with why you came in. Um, or you were given a medication that causes serious injury uh, because of a serious side effect of that drug that, and half the times that should have never been given or should have been preventable, et cetera. Um, about one in four doctor visits where a prescription is written, 30 days later, a patient has some sort of injury from that prescription. Um, I think I, that study is, I think it's a little bit of a high number. I've never really believed that. But it certainly underlies the idea that it's very common. And the Institute of Medicine, which is a part of the National Academy of Sciences. It's, you guys all know the, the you guys all know the National Academies. Um, the IOM is sort of the medical arm of that. They did, uh, they put together a report in the late 1990s called, uh, and the report was called To Air is Human. And they estimated that between 44 and 98,000 Americans die from medical errors every year. And just to put that into context, uh, that's more common than car accidents, which is about 43,000 deaths, breast cancer, which is about 42,000 deaths, or HIV AIDS, which causes about 16,000 deaths. So medical errors cause between 44 and 98,000 deaths a year. And I will, um, I, I, you know, so I think when you put together $2.1 trillion, 54.9% of the times we're doing it right, and we're killing between 50 and 100,000 people a year. And some of those numbers are a little bit questionable and there's been disagreement, but there's no disagreement about the fact that, you know, we have a problem. Um, the, the, the value proposition of healthcare is completely, is completely haywire. Um, people aren't getting the right treatments, people are getting injured. The high cost of healthcare is a huge threat to the federal budget. When the Congressional Budget Office thinks about the next 20 years for the federal government, the, the single scariest item is Medicare. Um, you know, if you ask GM and Ford whether they think about health care costs, uh, they're getting killed by health care costs. And 50 million people uninsured, a large chunk of that is because health care is so expensive. If you work full time as a, a minimum wage worker, you're not going to spend 70% of your pre-tax income on health care. You're just not going to do that. So. Um, anyway, so, uh, you know, so I, I, at this point, I, I'm hoping that everybody is feeling at least somewhat despondent about the quality of care they receive. And let me be very, very clear that you can't go to the Brigham or Mass General or some fancy place, the Mayo Clinic, and escape all this stuff. You can't. Um, I've looked at the quality data from Mass General. I've looked at it from Mayo. They're a little bit better than average but they're not all that terrific. So this is not a problem that is only for the other half, as it were. Um, questions or thoughts about this? Yeah. I was wondering, you know, at the beginning you started with a slide showing our spending compared to other developed countries. Yeah. What are, what's their data coming in at? What, are they having the same kind of error rates that we are? I mean, are they performing any better than we are? For right, the same? it begs that question, doesn't yeah. it? And, um, and you see that I didn't show you that data uh, for a reason. Uh, two things. If, I, um, if, I wanted, if you wanted to ask me what does this look like for the rest of the world or the other high-income countries, I would say I have no idea because those countries in general are far behind us in terms of collecting and systematically analyzing quality data. They all get it. They all get it's important. Um, and there's some efforts in this area, but they're not doing it. As, and we're, we're at least beginning to measure it. Um, but they have some fairly in place some to countries do, that. do, you know, like Denmark. Yeah, and, right. Denmark and, and UK has just kind of gone exactly. Right a bunch of countries yeah. have done a lot of uh, of effort. In, uh, you know, the Netherlands is another mm -hmm. place, right. uh, Finland, etc. But anyway, the point is, uh, they are not collecting this data, and, and not because they don't want to, but they have not had. In some ways, we've had about twenty years of work into defining these quality indicators, how you collect it, and, and we've been doing a lot more work in this area than most of the other countries. So I think they're going to catch up much more quickly because they do have the IT infrastructure right. to do it. And if you, and this 10% of hospitalized patients data, it, it's been repeated in Canada, the UK, Australia, 
and their numbers all come out to between 9 and 13 percent. So that suggests that they're doing exactly the same as we are on that. Yeah. The classification of injuries from medical care has been published in France according to <coughs> the number of injuries for each hospital. So there was a list and of like hundreds of hospital and the best pupils and the, the worst pupils so that people could first avoid going where there were problems and yeah. the hospital could uh, be aware of it and try to get up so I, I had not known that about France and I will look into it I'm, I'm, and, and in the US and that's actually exactly where I want to go next with this is that people are trying to do exactly that kind of stuff in terms of making that you know pulling together data like that, putting it out there, and seeing what effect it has in terms of people maybe making better choices about healthcare. I'm not sure whether the government or the press collected and reorganized yeah. the data according to, to a list of hospitals. And the question is, is that, does doing stuff like that actually make a difference? Does it make care better? <clears throat> Which is a big interest of mine. Yeah? Can you talk a bit more about the indicators and how those were measured? Um, because what I understood was that it due to what the most common, obvious form of care should be available for a certain kind of problem, and that's what those indicators are. Yeah. These are all 439 things for which there is very good scientific basis. Okay. okay. So meaning there's been good randomized controlled trials, there have been many, many studies that say that this medication is highly effective mm -hmm. for this condition, and it's been done eight times, and nobody wants to do that study anymore because it's been proven that this drug works. Okay. It's kind of like, you know, sort of like aspirin for prevention of heart attacks in high-risk men. Okay. We got it. It works. Um, so it's, it's stuff like that. It's, you know, it's certain types of asthma therapies that we always should give to kids when they come to the emergency room um, because we have very good evidence that it, that it ought to be done. And these guys spend a lot of time doing a very meticulous job developing these indicators. So if somebody has a contraindication to that medicine, that didn't count. They really wanted to come up with a number that was defensible so that the ideal rate here really, excuse me, really should be close to 100%. Okay. Um, and again, I think these are all very clinically based and things that, <clears throat> that and I can give you more examples, but it's, it's stuff that I think not too many people really argue with. Okay. Um, I have a question on that. Like, what percentage of the decisions that doctors make, you know, over the course of a given day kind of are decisions that are no-brainers like this? Um, I'm just curious kind of if this is a small part of kind of the decisions really that, uh, yeah, doctors are making? Yeah. Uh, I would say that uh, these are probably 5% of the things that we do. Mm -hmm. So there are probably 10,000 things that we do uh, across the spectrum of care. But these are the ones that are for which there's not much judgment involved. Because a lot of what we do, you know, another doctor might have done it differently. You don't know. This is stuff that there's not much judgment involved. Everybody agrees it's just right. You gotta do it. Um, so on one hand, it's a very tiny fraction of the whole thing. On the other hand, this is the part that we ought to just every it should be close to 100 percent. So then, having said that, yeah. Uh, having said that, that it's a very small percentage of what doctors average do. When we go to the slide where we say um, <clears throat> there's a high error rate or high risk rate, is that measuring? Um, just all the hundred percent of stuff that doctors do? Or? This is purely saying how often do people, when they encounter the healthcare system, mm -hmm. do they suffer an injury basically from that encounter? Do they get hurt because they went to a doctor? They got hurt because they went to a hospital. Hopefully, at the end of the day, they get hurt less often they get, than they get helped. Otherwise, you'd ask, why am I in this business at all? Um, but, but certainly, this is how often people get injured overall based on everything we do. Yeah. If you can go back to that last slide. I mean, these are no-brainers, but they're no-brainers in the abstract. Um, how, often, how often do doctors actually feel that the decision they're making is a no-brainer? Or, you know, giving aspirin <clears throat> to, um, you know, someone to prevent a heart attack um, may be the right choice, but that individual may have uh, gastrointestinal issues or other yeah. issues. So, so you need to, so, so go ahead. I, I mean, is that in, uh, counted, uh, account, does this account for that? They really tried very hard to account for that. Is if you count for it perfectly, I'm sure it doesn't. 
but they try to look through all the potential contraindications and say, okay, so you don't want to give aspirin to somebody who has aspirin ulcers, uh, somebody who has an allergy to aspirin, who has, you know, and then you come up with that list. And they really tried to do it in a way that at the end of the day, it was very clinically defensible as these are sort of the patients that we all agree, yeah, these guys ought to be getting that aspirin, or these guys ought to be getting that beta blocker. Um, so I, you know, do I think they got it perfect? No, there are people who criticize individual numbers, but no one, I think, clinically looks at this and says, this is actually terrific care and we're just not doing a good job of measuring it. Um, I, I honestly firmly believe this suggests care in America is really unacceptably mediocre. And it's unacceptably mediocre no matter who you are. Yeah. So are these numbers gathered? I mean, I'm wondering whether the, um, the, the breakdown is in when you're sitting in <coughs> the examination room and you say, I have chest pain, and the doctor doesn't prescribe or doesn't give you aspirin. Or is it, is it that interaction, or is it sort of the, the, from the, the minute that you walk in the emergency room and maybe never see a doctor, or maybe, you know, other experiences. And so a doctor would have said, yes, that person should have gotten aspirin, but that person never really encountered the... Um, right. Luckily, I mean, the way... So if you, if you think about heart attacks, for instance, luckily most of the times when somebody has a heart attack, they end up seeing a doctor, uh, if they go to the hospital at all. Now, obviously, if you just die from your heart attack at home, that doesn't show up here. These guys were only looking post-facto. So they found everybody who went to a hospital who was diagnosed with a heart attack. So if somebody went to the hospital and their heart attack got missed doesn't show up here. So it's a whole bunch of other stuff that doesn't show up here. But if you got diagnosed with a heart attack and you were in the hospital for five days, they go through the charts and say, did somebody ever give that patient an aspirin? Somebody ever give that patient a beta blocker? If they didn't, are any of the contraindications to that medicine that we know maybe somebody said, eh, maybe I shouldn't give it for one of these reasons, is that listed anywhere? And then you say, well, maybe people don't document it. You can always come up with an explanation for why some part of it may not be perfect. And I would say that, you, A, these guys did about as much as one could ever expect someone to do to, to get it right. And maybe the truth is not 55%. Maybe the truth is 60%. But the truth ain't 90%. And, and I would suggest that for $2.1 trillion, or for any amount of money, we should be expecting, for these tiny number of things, we should be expecting 95 98%. And anything less than that is unacceptable. Yeah. Is a death count from diseases related to the indicator? These 44 to 98,000 deaths? You know, this is just an estimate based on the hundreds of studies that have been done in this area. It's an estimate by the Institute of Medicine to say how many times do we think that people are dying due to medical care as opposed to due to the underlying disease that got them to the hospital. And this was their estimate. And again, I don't think it's perfect. Mm -hmm. But I think it was done based on all the best evidence by a bunch of reasonably smart people. And I think the numbers are probably close to right. Do we know what the errors are <clears throat> that don't result in death, but maybe if someone's kidney gets taken out, it's yeah. the wrong kidney? And so if people have tried to look at the overall number of injuries that don't yeah. result in death, it, it's somewhere probably north of a million a year. North of a million. Yeah. So, you know, and that sort of makes sense. About 5 to 10 percent of injuries lead to death, but about 90 to 95 percent of injuries, people survive them. So maybe they end up on dialysis, maybe they end up on, but they don't die from it. You're, you're probably going here next, but I, my question in the previous slide is that 40 percent of the time, this best practice thing is not happening, and there's a number of reasons you could yeah. hypothesize, and which of those bear out? Are they, yeah. do they know about it, and they're just lazy or sloppy? Do they not know about it? Uh, do they know about it and they forgot, or do they disagree with it? Yeah. Right. None um, of them are so, particularly reassuring, but. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, this is my transition slide, but it also has a point underlying it, which is um, that you know about eighty to ninety percent of healthcare in America is paper based. Yeah. Um, and that gets at. So this is your question. Um, I do believe, and I'm not just saying this because I'm a physician, but I do believe most doctors and nurses are terrific. They're well-trained. They're well-intentioned. Most doctors and nurses wake up in the morning and don't say, I'm going to go out and give bad care and make sure I hurt people today. I think people work very long hours. If you look at the hours that physicians work, um, if you look at the amount of years of training that goes into uh, training physicians in America, it's much, 
A, it's much longer than most other countries. And I think doctors are very well trained. And I do think they're well intentioned. So I don't think the problem is fundamentally that, um, that, that people don't care or they're lazy. So then the question is, what is it? And I would say a few things. I mean, one is that our payment scheme is completely flawed. So our system pays for quantity of healthcare. You do more, you get paid more. Okay? So I'm a physician and I, and I get paid by a number of visits. And if I provide lousy care, I get the exact same amount of money as if I provide terrific care. And if terrific care takes longer, you know where the, where the incentives are. Um, and that becomes really problematic, I think, in other parts of healthcare. You know, the healthcare organizations are, are I think, are, are flawed. And what I mean by that is this. You know, 30 years ago, if you had a heart attack, you went to the hospital. I'm just going to stick with this example. We basically didn't have any therapies for heart attacks. You know, aspirin as a treatment for a primary heart attack was probably mid-80s. So let's say in 1975, you had a heart attack. You went to the hospital. What did they do for you? They put you in a hospital bed, probably stayed there for two months. Um, you got, you know, the, they turned down the lights and sort of everything was very quiet. And they try to, you know, and mortality rate was 30% within 30 days. Well, 30-day mortality for heart attacks now is about 10 12%. And how do we get so much better? Well, because we do an unbelievable amount of stuff when they come in uh, to people when they come in with their heart attack. We give them incredibly toxic drugs. We take them to the catheterization lab, and while they're having the heart attack, thread a, a <clears throat> catheter through their groin into their heart, give them either a blood, a blood, uh, a clot busting drug, or open up that artery. This is all high risk stuff. But we do it, and we do it in people who are 90 years old and have six other conditions and are on 15 medications. And most of the time, majority of the times, we do it and people do well. But the difference is, you know, one of the sort of uh, really international experts in patient safety is a guy named Lucian Leap. And Lucian always says, he was a, he's a pediatric surgeon and he trained in the 60s. And he said when he was a resident, there were about 20 medicines, period, 20, 25 medicines that doctors ever used. They could keep all of it right here. You knew the medicines, you knew the doses, you knew which interacted with which. There were 20. We can all remember 20 things. And now, five, ten thousand. 10,000? And the question is, can you keep 10,000 drugs and all of their interactions and all of their doses and half of them sound like the other half? Can you keep it all straight? Can you all keep it all in your head and, and do this? And the answer is no, you can't. But the healthcare organizations have not, I think, adequately responded to the change that has happened in healthcare in the last 30 years. In some ways, we're a victim of our own success. 439 indicators, 30 years ago, maybe there were six. And we could do those six all the time because there were only six things. And now we're at 430 um, or probably much higher. So here's the part where, again, and this is, this is very helpful, and here's the part that I would like to just make one statement about, and then I want to get, um, I want to hear from you guys what you think. So, a couple of the big problems in healthcare is there's no transparency. Uh, how many of you guys have been to a, phys a physician or a hospital in the last year? Okay. How much did it cost, Sydney? How much did it cost? No. How much did it cost? Okay. <laughs> Like yeah, but you don't know. I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> Anybody know how much their visit costs? Yeah. Seven hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. Did you have? Did you get a bill for seven hundred dollars? Mm, no, I saw something. That, someone said that it was seven hundred. No, I didn't hear something. Right, but your insurance. I got a bill that showed that how much. And do you know how much your insurance paid? Two hundred. Yeah, it's less than that. <laughs> 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 it's like okay. Okay. I think I think your point might be made better. I know how much. Medical care for my dog costs, but I don't really know how much it costs for yeah, you. Right. Right. <laughs> um, well, so th there is this incredible opaqueness because um, your bill might say, first of all, most people don't look at their bill, right? But if you look at the bill, it might say 700 and then, uh, and then Harvard Pilgrim pays 275 And you're like, how do they get away with that? When I have bills in any other sector of the economy, I don't get to say, I'll pay you 40%. Is that good? I have to usually pay the whole amount. But you know, there's just all of this cost shifting and craziness 
So cost accounting is completely opaque to the entire world, I think, except for some small number of people in insurance companies and hospital and doctor billing offices who understand what all this stuff actually costs. Um, and Sydney, how good was the care you got? It was very good. Yeah. <laughs> I have no idea, though. Yeah, how do you know? I mean, I was going to say, how do you know it was good? Um, well, I, I got better for the problem that I went in to okay. my doctor about. And do you know that you wouldn't have gotten better if you had I don't done know. no? <laughs> right. Um, you know, because 90% of the things that I see patients for, they'll, they're they going to get better whether they saw me or not. Just true, right? I mean, it's like people come in with their colds. I've had a fever. I've had this cough. I've got this runny nose. I feel like I feel like hell. And, I, you know, I see them and I examine them and stuff. And I, but if they'd never seen me, they'd be better in two days anyway. But they're convinced it was because of me, because I told them, you're going to be better in two days. <laughs> you know, here's some Tylenol. Um, so, so the point is, we don't know. And in any other part of our lives, when we buy cars, when we go to the restaurant, service industry, non-service industry, you know how much things cost. You have, you have some way to judge how good it is. Um, and my general argument is that in healthcare we don't have that, and that's very problematic. And uh, you know the two main things that people have thought about to kind of help reg regulate the quality of healthcare is is regulation. So when so I'm a practicing physician in Massachusetts, I have to show them that I went to a, a real live medical school, that I did residency, that I have not committed any criminal activities, and then they give me the little certificate and say you can go practice medicine in Massachusetts. Well, let me tell you, that sets the bar very, very low, right? Because if they don't ask me, are, do you actually do the right thing for your patients? No, I just haven't committed any crimes, and I, yes, I went to a real medical school. So the regulation and certification sets the bar very low. And medical malpractice, now, well, it's a little controversial talking about medical malpractice with lawyers in the room, but I'll just tell you that, you know, it, it's been a dismal failure in terms of thinking about I effects on safety and quality of healthcare. Why do I say that? Because about 95% of the times that there are injuries to patients from medical care, there's no malpractice. 98% of the times. Some very, very high number. And a good chunk of the times that there is malpractice, there's a malpractice lawsuit. A bunch of the times there wasn't even an injury from medical care. A lot of the times it wasn't preventable. It certainly wasn't negligent. And so it's the classic example of when the AMA says the trial lawyers are doing blah, 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 they're right. And when the trial lawyers say the doctors are just being defensive, but there's a lot more out there than they're willing to admit, they're right. It's just that there's very little overlap between bad care and malpractice. And so for me, as a physician, I think of malpractice as a relatively random event that has almost nothing to do with the quality of care I provide. And there are some things I can do to help control it, like be nice to my patients. So when I do when injure you them, use the term malpractice, you mean actual litigation? I it? mean like the the lawsuit and then yeah, the no. and then the and I'm speaking as a as a non-lawyer, so I don't know, but that's what I think about. Yeah, I've gotten sued. Right. Um, no, I, I just meant yeah, as a, as opposed to a doctor doing something wrong. Right. right. No, that which that's is a, right. I, that's yeah. a separate category. That's a separate that's category. That's the category you're distinguishing. Right. Yeah, but, exactly. but if for for it to work, you have to change your behavior somehow. You need to be more careful because you're worried about being sued for right. doing something wrong, and you're saying it doesn't factor in. Doesn't factor in. Doesn't factor in. Is there any um, knowledge about the fear of malpractice leads to a lot of extra tests or extra defensive care medicine. being defensive? Um, yeah, there's a lot, as you might imagine. This is a, an area <laughs> of great political debate, right? It depends on which side of the political spectrum you come down to on. It's where you end up usually pulling data. The truth in my mind is. Does malpractice lead to defensive medicine? Absolutely. Is it a huge factor in the two point one trillion dollars? No. You know. Factor though in injuries because a lot of the tests and all could be actually invasive and could actually lead to some of these. Is there any study? I think study? That there, there's very little data on this. Um, I think there's very little doubt in my mind that some of that defensive medicine leads to bad care mm -hmm. because you end up doing tests you really never should have done. And all these tests will have false positives. They, then you have to go chase down. Um, and in general, it pushes people to do too much. And that actually leads to bad care. OK. Um, other questions or thoughts about this? So what I'm going to do is tell you about one specific uh, part of the response. And that's um, 
the New York State Cardiac Surgery Program. How many guys have you, uh, I mean, how many of you guys have ever heard about the New York State Cardiac Surgery Reporting Program? One person. Can you tell me anything about it? It's fine if not. I don't know the details about okay. it, but there's there's a on a public record so people can evaluate how different doctors have done based on some baseline of, of different procedures or success and failure rate. Terrific. So exactly. Um, what New York State did, and they did this in the early 90s, but is really becoming a model today for healthcare, I think. This is the part that sort of is the response that I'm somewhat hopeful is going to make a difference. Um, what they did in the early 90s was they looked at the data for cardiac surgeons doing heart bypass surgery in New York, and they found huge variations. Let me see if I can just show you. Here it is. 1991, cardiac surgery in New York. 31 hospitals, this is risk-adjusted mortality rate. So this is <clears throat> doing really good, and they got the national experts on risk adjustment. They put them in a room, said, how would you do this? And they did it in a way so that it sort of leveled the playing field. So hospitals that took care of sicker patients should have had the same risk-adjusted mortality rate as hospitals that took care of relatively healthy people. There were 31 hospitals in the New York state of New York doing heart bypass surgery, and what they found was that the risk-adjusted mortality rate ranged from 0.5% to 7.3%, about a 15-fold difference between the best and worst hospitals. And that means about 1 in 200 patients here died of heart bypass surgery, and about 1 in 14 died here of uh, heart bypass surgery. They looked at this data, and they said, this is unbelievable. These are all surgeons in the state of New York, only 31 hospitals. This is unacceptable. And what they did was they started publishing data about cardiac surgery mortality for every hospital and every surgeon, you know, made it, making it publicly available. And you can imagine that in the no early 90s, the way you got this information, if you wanted it, was you wrote to the Department of Health and they would send you the latest report. And uh, as of about 2000, all this stuff is on the internet. So you just go, you can download every file from 91 through 2005 or 2006. Um, so that's what the data looked like in 91. And then here's what it looks like in 2003. Still a bunch of variation, but let me remind you one thing. Here you have a bunch of hospitals that are at, so majority of the hospitals are between three and four. A bunch of hospitals, four, five, six, seven percent mortality, right, for heart bypass surgery. In 2003, on the same scale, it looks a little different. So there are three hospitals, sorry, this is getting cut off, three hospitals that are over 4%, but the, national, but the statewide average is now a little over 2, and almost everybody's under 3. So clearly something happened over these 12 years um, to do this. I would say this is not terrific. There's still a lot of variation, but it's a lot better. Yes? Thoughts about this? How do you think this happened? Let me see if I can just show you. Here's what happened to overall mortality rates from 89 through 2005. The, the statewide average dropped from about 3.5% to a little under 2%, which is nice. It's a significant drop. Any thoughts about this? Why would just creating these reports, putting them out there, do this? Yeah. So one would hope maybe that one thing it could do is to put the bad surgeons out of business, right? Um, and how would that happen? Publicity? Yeah, so you can imagine that the worst hospitals and the worst surgeons would see big drops in market share, right? People would stop going there, and then all of a sudden they'd say, eek, and they'd either go out of business or they'd get better. So that would be one mechanism. Any other thoughts? How might it work? Well, let me just, since we're talking, how does this work? Um, so here's some data. We took about 15 years, so 10, 12 years of, of data. And we did this for hospitals and for surgeons. And I'm just showing you the, the hospital data. So what I did was we said, OK, report card comes out. If you're in the top 10%, if you're one of the really good hospitals, <coughs> this was your market share, all the hospitals here, this was your market share before the report card came out. Here's what happened to your market share after the report card came out. And what you see, and this is not statistically significant, this is just random noise.
But at best, it looks like the best guys are losing market share and the worst guys are gaining market share. I don't actually think that's true, and, and the statistical test suggests that there's no, thing, no effect. But it certainly doesn't look like the, the, the people who are the bad performers are, are losing market share. Everybody's going, oh my god, uh, Columbia Presbyterian, terrible mortality rates, I'm not going there. So unfortunately, that's, that's what you would have hoped for, and it didn't, it didn't actually happen. Other thoughts, other theories? Yeah. Is the price of care changed? Price of care. Right, for, for this order. Right, so you can imagine that these guys maybe started getting, it became more expensive. That sure would be nice, um, but there are people who've done the work of talking to whether health plans use this data to maybe pay more to the good guys, or remember, most people don't pay for cardiac surgery themselves. So if you're a surgeon or a hospital, you can't just raise the, uh, we cost 15000 now we're the best in the state, we're going to 20000 People aren't going to pay that, the health plan has to pay that, and that didn't happen. Yeah. The technology would have changed in 10, 12 years. Right. So tell me more. Well, that might drop everything down and it, flatten it out. Fair enough. And, and I did, I did um, skip over this. But cardiac surgery mortality, because in the whole country, the mortality rates got better. There's pretty convincing data that it fell much faster in New York than it did in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, uh, et cetera. So there is a sense that, that this fell faster and, and, and more so than, than other places, where presumably the technology changes were the same. Yeah. And as you were saying, in terms of your own practice, I mean, people, doctors aren't necessarily aware of, of what they're doing. Hospitals would have hard data to present to themselves and say, "This is where we're really at," as opposed to your self-perception of where you're at. And right. It would give them uh, markers against what you're for. Right. So that I think is a is a major factor. It's hard to quantify that and study that, but I think that's a big factor. Yep. Well, two probably related things. One is you then put in self-monitoring systems to actually gauge where you are and what you're doing well and what you're doing not. Yeah. Or perhaps more importantly, you look at the people who aren't losing so many people and you go over and talk to them, buy them a coffee and say, how come? Why is your mortality <laughs> half of mine? Yeah. Right. So that's what, again, that's what you hope happens. Right. And there's good anecdotal evidence that some of that actually started happening. Yeah. That surgeons started getting, because they go to conferences. Yeah. And, and guess what? The surgeons were paying close attention to this information. Patients are not playing, paying any attention whatsoever. But the surgeons are paying very close attention. And they know, why is, the, why is Frank, like, why is his mortality rate so low? And they go talk to him at the conference and say, what do you do? You know, and all that stuff begins to happen. Uh, and then here's the one other slide that's, I think, kind of uh, dramatic, which is what we did was we had said, uh, what are the chances that you're going to stop practicing in the state of New York after a report card comes out? And if your performance is in the top, second, or third quartile, basically about three to four percent of surgeons leave. And they leave because they retire, they're moving, sort of a natural rate of people stopping practice. And then we looked at the fourth quartile and we said, well, these are the bad performers, the ones who got rated badly. About 20% of them quit over the next two years. Did they quit or did they move to Mississippi? Massachusetts, <laughs> right? <laughs> Jersey. Uh, Jersey, okay. Yeah, I went to high school in Jersey, so it was personal. Um, and so what we actually did was we actually tracked all these guys down. And the answer is some of them just quit. Some of them moved. Um, and you can imagine there are potential confounders, like maybe the surgeons who were older uh, are likely to have high mortality rates, and maybe they're more likely, to, they're clearly more likely to quit because they're coming up to retirement. So we did a bunch of adjustments to adjust for, for surgeon age and surgeon practice and stuff. And what you find is that the guys in the bottom are about three times more likely to quit. And what it says is people really do pay attention to this information. You know, a lot of times what it was was the chief of surgery came to the person and said, listen, your mortality rate sucks. You're making our hospital look bad. Can you do something about this? They either could fix it, or they just decided, I don't want to practice in this environment anymore, and left. So my point on this is people clearly do pay attention. All right, so in the last sort of 10, 15 minutes that I have, I'm going to not, what I want to just make the last sort of transition point is what has happened is the New York State, yeah. I'm sorry. No, please. Just a quick question. You said that 
that the survey didn't really have much of an impact on the patient. Yep. I would imagine that if I knew something like this, I would feel very aggressive in a situation where I felt like the, the person who I was seeking advice from was a lower rated um, professional than, than his co workers. And, and I'm just sort of surprised that this didn't. Well, so I'm, filter out. I, I yeah. completely agree. And there was a survey that somebody did of patients undergoing cardiac surgery in New York and asked the question, did you know this report card existed? Majority of them didn't. Then they said, if you knew that this report card existed, first of all, it's free, would you be willing to pay for it? How much would you be willing to pay for this information that tells you whether your surgeon is a 7% mortality or 0.5% mortality? And most people said about 20 bucks or less. Which sort of boggles my mind to suggest that you're not willing to pay 50 bucks to find out that the surgeon who's going to perform open heart surgery on you might have a mortality rate that's seven percent as opposed to 0.5 percent. Like, what you, what is going on? There? However, <laughs> yes. isn't a lot of people, especially with HMOs, they have no say in who they get referred to. There is so, some of that. The insurance angle of that. There is there is an insurance angle, and and uh, and but people usually have more than one choice. Usually, not everyone, but most people, you know, there's a network of maybe six cardiac surgeons in your, in your, in your network. Okay. But if those six, at least you can look at their mortality rates and have some sense of, is this guy at least average? Right, but you need a referral for, for pe a lot of people with HMOs. And what if your doctor is just saying, no, this no. is my friend and here's where you're going. Right. So, and they surveyed actually cardiologists who do the referrals to the cardiac surgeons. And cardiologists, they were asked, do you believe in the validity of these report cards? And the cardiologist generally said, yep, they're pretty good. We believe in them. Yeah. And then they said, do you use them yeah. to refer? No. That's exactly. So, they, they and so there's this huge the disconnect fence, between like everybody going, yeah, these are pretty good. Yeah. Do you use them? No. Because he's my friend. Because <laughs> I've always referred him to Dr. Right. You know, Dr. Jai. And Dr. Jai is a great guy. Forget the fact that his mortality rate right. is awful. But you're still holding on to the well-intentioned doctor model despite this? Uh, I mean, I think they're well-intentioned <laughs> on some level. There's clearly a problem, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and, but, but the drop in mortality in New York has made policymakers sort of around the country say, we've got to have much more transparency in the healthcare system. It clearly has an effect. We don't know why it works the way it does. We can't figure out why it is that patients don't seem to use this information. So part of it is if you go to the New York State Report Card website, and that's one of the links from the, that I gave to Amr, um, and you download one of these report cards, they're not all that easy to understand. Well, that's what I was going to say. I mean, I've been to a lot of these websites. And, you know, Massachusetts has some of them. Yeah, Massachusetts is now up and running. And you go look it through them, and it's, it's, I it's mean, you awful. You have to go digging through spreadsheets and you know, just try and find some simple metrics. It's horrible. It's horrible. Is. It's, and it's so amazing. this is a place where I realize with seven or whatever, ten minutes, I'm getting, getting to what I'm hoping is, a, is something you guys, I mean, this is a place where, like, the Internet has been transformative in lots of other places, in lots of other industries. And in healthcare, it's doing, it's so far has been doing nothing. Yeah. Well, on, on specifically transparency, yep. uh, the legal question that um, comes up is why hospitals are not required to give patients the records in the electronic format where they could be shared or aggregated on the internet in order to derive these things. Okay. Specifically, the Harvard hospitals, both of them, yeah. have these records available electronically because they send them to the Social Security Administration, yet these same things are not available to any individual patient. Right. A uh, couple of thoughts. Uh, I spent a lot of time thinking about exactly this topic. Uh, some facts uh, and data for the country. Um, about 90% of hospitals don't have an electronic health record. The, the ones that do. Okay, so hold on, just one second. So first of all, 90% of hospitals are paper-based. Fundamentally, that's a problem unto itself. What are we doing in 2008 with paper-based records? But fine, let's talk about the Harvard hospitals um, that are electronic. Let's talk about Brigham and, and the BI. 50 yards from each other. I was attending at the Brigham about a year ago, saw a patient who came to the Brigham one night because the ER and the BI, at the BI was full. And she's gotten all of her care at the BI. And I saw her the next morning, and I wanted to get her records. The BI has an electronic record. The Brigham has an electronic record. So how did we get the BI records? Mm -hmm. Got a piece of paper. She signed it. 
faxed it, they printed out the electronic record, and they faxed it, and then we had to create a paper binder and put it all in there. It worked, I got the information I needed, but we have a problem. But that's not the problem I'm asking for. No, but let me just finish the, the, the thoughts. Um, so there are two issues around sharing of information. One is you can ask, well, why doesn't the patient control this information? Why doesn't the patient get it? There are some laws, and the laws say patients always have a right to get their record. Mm -hmm. And if you want to pay some nominal fee, 10, 15 bucks, I'll print the whole darn thing out for you. Um, the second is that it's very clear, and again, I'm getting a, be, a little beyond my own expertise, so push back if I'm getting this wrong, but it strikes me it's very clear that the, the hospital owns the record. The doctor owns the record. When I see a patient and I'm writing a note, it's my note. Maybe about you, but it's my note. Mm -hmm. I own it. You know, um, Amazon owns information about my shopping patterns. Maybe about my shopping patterns, but Amazon owns that information. And I can't say to Amazon, my shopping information, give it to me. At least with records, you can but do I'm, that. I'm asking a legal question of people here okay. are, about this. And regardless of ownership, or at least my understanding of the legal issues of ownership, if the hospital, if there's a law that says MGH has to give me my records, which there is, yep. and they choose to give them to me on paper in order to make it hard for me to correlate these things myself over the internet with other people who have had heart attacks yep. or been treated, what part of the law applies to that particular straightforward thing? It's not ownership as far as I can tell. Well, you're getting beyond my area. Uh, no, <clears throat> ownership uh, is uh, almost irrelevant okay. because even though he owns it, you have a right to, to have it. Mm -hmm. uh, you, want, you want it for free in electronic form. I didn't say free. Or, or you want it in electronic I form. I said 10 or 15 dollars. I'm not sure. Why don't you already have access to it in electronic Ah, because they don't want to give it to me. They have it for the Social Security. If I file a disability claim with the Social Security Administration, they will take that PDF file, they will send it to the SSA, but they will not give me from either the uh, BI or MGH that same well, exact I mean, file. The, the I have BI, have has, uh, BI has an electronic system that patients have access to. It, it leaves something to be desired. But Yeah, and so does uh, the Brigham. Patient but, uh, it is not in a form to be used on the Internet. Well, there's a it's not no, easily it's not easily exportable changing export it. it's a portal yeah, yeah. It's, uh, a, it's, a, it's a consumer I mean, your, your question is, is, is an interesting one in the old days when there was only paper and freedom of information acts and you knew there was some paper in washington that you wanted uh they would make you go there and pay for xerox and costs uh, so i i think you're asking a question that hasn't really been answered but um I'm, I'm just, uh, I've, I've looked at access to electronic medical records uh, because I'm interested in electronic medical records and I can't understand why. Um, the only one I'm familiar with is the BI, which has all kinds of problems, but at least it provides you with free electronic access. And sad to say Not it's one of the best in the country. Wait, l let me uh, just say this about that. Yeah. If you it's take the few research Heiser. data, yeah. The largest yeah, reason why people want to yeah, see their records is to look for medical errors. The way to look for medical errors, the, the top-ranking reason, the way to look for medical errors is to have the complete record, the one you would get under the HIPAA privacy laws, yeah. as, as a PDF file or whatever else they're, they're willing to give it to you. So having a portal, if that's what you meant by having your records or a thing, does not serve the purpose of looking for medical errors. L let me just well, cover by the that's some circumstances law. it does, and other circumstances it doesn't. Let, let me let me take a step back and give a broader picture. I think there is little doubt that we all agree. I certainly agree, and I think everybody agrees that the ideal is that there is an electronic record. I, as a patient, have control over it. That has information about every doctor visit and every hospital visit I've had, all going in one way or another, feeding in. So it's comprehensive. It's complete. And it will make care better. It will get rid of duplication. It'll get rid of all the bad stuff. I think it'll make care cheaper, hopefully, if we get rid of the huge amount of duplication that gets done in the healthcare system. Um, the, the, the technical, cultural challenges to achieving that vision are, are many. And when you ask the question, why on earth, when, my, when I was seeing that patient at the Brigham, why did I have to go through this crazy process, for instance? It's because at the end of the day, both the Brigham and the BI are convinced that it's to their advantage not to share this stuff electronically with each other. 
Well, it gives mobility the, to the I patient. agree with the second part, but the first part is completely, the first part of what you said, the technical and cultural challenge yeah. is not at all true. In other words, the patient has a right to take their information from yep. the Brigham yep. and give it to you at the, uh, at the BI. Yep. And that's not a cultural or a technical issue. Well, there's it's only the second thing, which is the strategic. But there are cultural and technical issues. And it sounds like there are people here who know far more about electronic, electronic medical records than I do, but I'm going to wade in anyway. Wade in. Just correct me as I get it wrong. Um, there are technical issues around, uh, um, around metadata, around how to represent what metadata counts and how to represent it. There are cultural issues around how much of the information, does the doctor's notes, is that part of the record? There are uh, cultural questions around privacy in two regards. One is, does the patient who you say has complete control over, well, okay, do you, does the patient, is the patient entitled to not pass along certain data that she may find embarrassing or harmful or not want the doctor to know that she tried for other doctors and they, you know, um, how much control do we want, want to let patients have over it? And right. finally, there's this gigantic privacy issue of um, coming up with a way of identifying patients that can let two records be associated without um, having a unique identifier that can be tied to the real world person, which raises all sorts of issues about, for example, uh, your right to protect your privacy about AIDS or STDs or whatever it is you don't want people to know. So I disagree. I think there are gigantic technical and cultural issues. Let me just respond to that. Yeah. Uh, uh, those issues apply when you have provided to provider communications. All of the issues you've said are a huge technical and cultural problem. None of the issues that you, met, that you uh, brought up apply to a individual as an individual seeking health care services from a doctor because there's nothing networked about that. When I go to the BI, they can identify me biometrically so that the next time I come back, they know I'm the same person. I can't screw them up. They have their own copy of the part that they own, so I can't besmirch them or they can digitally sign stuff if they wanted to. So all of the issues having to do with patient privacy, identity management, and all of these things do not apply relative to the way patients are getting together on the internet. They only apply with a provider-to-provider -provider interaction. I, I, so I fundamentally agree with, and there's, you're getting into the issue of personal health records yeah. that people can control. Um, why, don't, why don't we go ahead and just, yeah. So I'm, I wanted to get to, I'm, I'm confused now between what the, where you see the mechanism for this transparency having an effect on the system. There's a vast difference between myself as the individual patient having access to my records versus um, a, a, a collection of data that exists about, that, that you were presenting before. And so there's this, this one is, it seems, there seems to be this mechanism about um, that the patient makes the smarter choices versus the hospitals make Right. Um, the smart system. Yeah. So, uh, uh, no, so are you you're proposing a specific mechanism whereby this transparency actually causes change? Right. Uh, great question. And you're right that those are two wholly different things, uh, related but but pretty different. Let me give you a couple of thoughts about them. Um, one is that I have some evidence on the hospital side. The the data that I showed you. There's some other data that suggests that when you start making this stuff publicly available, um, hospitals, surgeons, doctors start paying attention and start doing things with this. Um, it is slow. The, the response by these healthcare providers is hardly the kind of response. I mean, cardiac surgery 12 years later, yeah, it's a little bit better. It's hardly terrific. There's still a four, eight-fold variation. So my point is that that's a pretty slow but important mechanism for improvement. The other part that you bring up, the issue of consumer engagement, consumer access to information, this stuff is wholly untested. Um, until very recently, and I'd say even as of today, most people have no idea. Most people don't know what's in their electronic record. They don't know what medicines they ought to be getting. Now, I'm not proposing that every patient should become a doctor and know exactly what all the right therapies are, but I am suggesting that the one way in which the world has changed very dramatically between when I was a resident in 1998, 1999, and now that I'm practicing, is that the information with which patients come to see me is dramatically different. In 97, 98, if they had a disease, they maybe knew a couple of things about it. Now people come in with reams of information, tons of data that are out there. And right now, it's mostly, most majority of doctors just find it annoying. 
be perfectly honest, because people come in and say, I read that I have blah, 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 blah. And then you have to actually take a step back and try to work through it, et cetera. But, but to me, that's just because that's where we are with information on the internet today, is that for a lot of healthcare information, it's, it's out there, but the sort of categorization, waiting, kind of figuring out what's good information, what's not so good information, that stuff hasn't, hasn't matured as much as it, it could. And, and certainly it has not had the effect that I can figure out in terms of patients engaging with the healthcare system in a positive light. But I think that's, we're on the cusp of that really changing. Um, but I don't know, I mean, what, I, this is the part I really want to get feedback on. I mean, what do you guys think? Uh, Isn't one of the, the fundamental problems here that, and I think the problem with the economic choice, the consumer-based choice model is that, it, it, you know, even, a, even the cutting edge economists are turning away from the rational choice model as, as being flawed. Yeah. Um, that these are not rational choices that we're making, that decisions about our health implicate all sorts of ridiculous, you know, fears, not ridiculous, actually quite natural fears yeah. and concerns that we have, um, that our decision making isn't grounded on, you know, kind of number crunching our rational chances of survival, but, you know, whom we trust um, and people we know and, you know, in some cases people go to the worst case scenario and they automatically assume that they have every conceivable form of cancer and right. other people assume that they're indestructible and, and refuse to see the doctor. Right. But either way, I mean, th these are not rational choices. So our, I, what I'm asking about in terms of, of how the transparency of information will help us is, will it? Because is it, is it, it's not like my, my discovering that this TV is cheaper at this online retailer than this on other online retailer. That is, you know, that, that's apples to apples numbers and dollars. Yeah. Whereas you're talking about something that's both technically difficult to understand, emotionally difficult to grapple with, and where, you know, it, people aren't going to be in the position to make these rational choices. Yeah, no, it, it, it's a it's a totally fair point, and um, and this is in fact the place where maybe the model of patient or you know, consumer engagement with information as a transformative figure in healthcare won't work out. Again, for me, I, I'm not. I'm not convinced it will or won't. I, I'm really trying to find the empirical data. We don't have much yet. But I'm sort of thinking about how do we think that this information will begin to affect um, Well, one of the things you haven't really talked about is the whole role of the uh, health plans and payers that are involved in this whole multi-stakeholder yeah. matrix Yeah. when we start looking at quality and transparency. And there's now a big push kind of moving towards what are called uh, consumer-directed health plans where you have a high deductible coupled with an HRA or HSA. Um, have you looked at, or is, I mean, these are so new, is there just not any data yet to really define, okay, now that consumers are taking on great responsibility through a high deductible plan, are they using this information? Are they definitely? using this information, or are they starting to go to health grades or any of these other sites right. and starting to collect this information and look at it and say, okay, I'm going to make my decision based right. on their quality as well as their cost factor? Right. So, Right, it's a great question. And basically, let me just sort of provide a little br a greater context for those of you who don't know the underlying issues. The underlying issues are one of the when people on the right of the political spectrum look at this stuff that I just presented, they don't disagree with any of it. They say it's very obvious what the problem is, which is consumers are not behaving like consumers because they don't have any skin in the game. They don't have. It's a bad. It's actually a bad <laughs> phrase, but that's what they use it. This is what they use. So. Uh, and the argument goes, you know, you have no idea how much things cost. So if it costs 400 bucks or 200 bucks, why do you care? Your copay is 15 bucks. If any other part of the economy ever worked that way, yeah, costs would go through the roof. People would always buy more expensive stuff, or they wouldn't care, certainly. And, and so what we need is transparency. And when you have transparency in terms of quality information linked to having more skin in the game, you actually have to pay for the entire visit out of your own pocket. If Sydney had to pay for her visit, she would know exactly how much it costs. But she has some vague notion that it costs about 200 bucks. Don't mean to pick on you. Um, right? She would know exactly how much it costs, and if it costs 200 bucks, she might actually say to the doctor, 150? And try to negotiate. Um, and maybe that would affect things. The po problem is maybe about 2 3% of Americans have uh, these high deductible right. health plans. And they're an atypical bunch. And we don't know how this is going to play out. My personal feeling is it's not going to be big. It's, these people are not in it because they want to be activist consumers who want to, who think they can get a better deal by 
doing, doing it because that's the only thing their employer offers because it's cheap. And, um, and I'm not sure, based on really the arguments that you've made, I'm not sure people are going to act like rational consumers in this context. But it seems to be growing in terms of... It is growing, plans and but I, you know, I, do I think it's going to ever hit 20%? Yeah. I doubt it. Yeah. I think they're going to peter out. Yeah. I'm very optimistic about this, despite Gene's... I'm not pessimistic. Like okay. and, 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 and so I, tell me about your optimism. I, I I'm excited about optimism. I, I think there's... <laughs> I, think there's uh, I don't want to depress you. I think there's a huge role for intermediaries in this, and that the intermediation is not working well right now, and that you go in and you have a certain person who gives you information, and you have no way to gauge whether that information is good, and then the secondary referrals that this person is giving is, is good or not. Yeah. And then additional layers, it could be better doctor-to-doctor -doctor referrals, it could be better management of hospitals, could be better weeding out of, of poor doctors. It could be an entirely independent intermediary that looks at healthcare outcomes and advises people like me that couldn't figure it out whether what works and what doesn't work. Right. And I only see upside in this. I, yeah. I think it's great. The other thing that, that I would like to see is it might be able to bring the notion of quality into healthcare, which you, I don't, if it's there, I don't know how to get it right now. I mean, my healthcare is coverage and procedures which is a really a bad proxy for good health care. Correct. And that good doctors is a much better proxy for that than procedures. Yeah, yeah. or I would say good systems. Oh. Yeah. yeah, probably the most important thing. Yeah. No, I, you know, I obviously on some level am optimistic about all the stuff you said too. Um, it's, it's really, my take is it's the beginning of a, of a very interesting journey about how transparency, better information. Yeah. Because if the bottom line is that someone like you can't navigate the health. I mean, I can't navigate the healthcare system half the times, and I'm like a physician who studies the healthcare system. Like yeah. this is terrible. Um, if but if you know if smart, educated people can't navigate the health, uh, the, you can imagine for the rest of the country what a disaster it is. But it does uh, provide this opportunity, and I always like to remember that 2.1 trillion dollars leaves plenty of interesting business models and cash uh, for people to come in and act as, as effective intermediaries. Yeah. One of the interesting things, um, I'm looking at other places where the internet has had sort of, a, in one way or another, some kind of transformative effect, is that there had to at some point be a really kind of disruptive, critical mass of sort of freaky data getting out there, and then people get comfortable with it, or it gets, you know, we sort of set norms about that. And I think, I don't know, I mean, I'm optimistic, this is really interesting, but I think people are so concerned about healthcare data being aggregated, being identified with the with an individual person and affecting every part of your life, that I think it's going to be slower or maybe scarier mm -hmm. one or the other. Yeah. Um, no, I think, I think that's right. I think there are some special issues around healthcare that have to do with privacy and confidentiality and, and that are real. I also think that my take has always been, and I was talking to Amar about this just before, is I, I always sort of feel like that stuff is solvable. Um, well, it certainly point, points more towards better sort of hospital to hospital data sharing. As that, I'm more optimistic about that than I am about something sort of disruptive and on a, on a internet sort of grassroots level happening. Yeah. I'm less optimistic about the hospital to hospital sharing. <laughs> <laughs> no, Maybe. No, for cultural reasons. I mean, again, I always come back to the BI and the Brigham, who are two Harvard teaching hospitals 50 yards from each other. You can throw a stone from one and hit the other, but you can't electronically send a file from one to the other. There's a problem. Yeah. Where do you see the possible impact of single payer data sharing today? you look at Medicare and what they do and whether it's better or worse? Yeah, you know, we have a, we don't have a, we obviously don't have a single payer, but we have the a government paying for 45% of health care, so pretty, pretty from the government's already the big payer, uh, and Medicare has been doing some innovative stuff around some of this, but it's, um, but it's sort of drops in the bucket, I mean, the stuff that they're doing. I don't necessarily... They're See, doing P for P this year. They're, they're doing P they're for just, P. Just they're just that. introducing yeah. it, and it's tiny amounts of money. Right. And, and yeah, it's little ditzels. Uh, I can actually 
uh, address that. Uh, the, the feeling in the people that, uh, that talk about this uh, that I get is that Medicare is actually one of the most evil things that's going on in this category. Mm -hmm. Yes, because everything in Medicare is set up as fee-for-service. And the thing you mentioned before that drives a lot of it's either quantity or quality thing is actually part of the reason this problem is so intractable. Yeah. To the extent, and this is not something, I, I care a lot about certain things having to do with privacy. This isn't something I care yeah. about. I'm, I'm, I think I'm a pretty objective reporter of this. What people who study this basically say is that it's never going to be fixed until Medicare starts paying for preventive services, for having a medical home, for having things on a subscription basis that take care of your health as opposed to those things which are fever service. Yeah. And increasingly, the private insurers are going in the direction of doing what Medicare does. So they're, because Medicare is so dominant, uh, they're actually less likely to innovate in their own right. Let, let, me, um, let me offer some, uh, I don't actually disagree with too much of that, but I do disagree with some of it. Uh, HMOs were, were an attempt to do exactly that stuff, offer more preventive services, uh, do all the stuff that fee-for-service doesn't because they had a motivation, which is keep patients healthy, man manage costs, etc. cetera. Uh, I'm not sure, I mean, they certainly did a pretty good job on quality, actually. The quality scores for Kaiser are much, much better than they are nationally. Be very clear about that. Um, but it hasn't worked out so, much, so, much, so well with the American public. Um, and part of it is because right now we have a couple of models. We have fee-for-service or capitation. Capitation is I, as a doctor, get 50 bucks a month per patient, and I take care of everything. And then the incentives to get set up, well, maybe Sydney doesn't need that CT scan because it's expensive and it comes out of my pocket. And that creates its own dynamic in terms of the relationship. And, and a lot of people, doctors and patients, really struggle with that. Yeah. But there, there's a third way, which I think the gentleman mentioned, which is that you, have, you don't have to have either of those two. You can have an independent third party that aggregate patient interests or that serve, that are not providing services yeah. that play that intermediary role, and that hasn't really been seen outside of the medical tourism yeah. and uh, buying drugs from Canada space. Right. Oh, I'd love to and see it happen. And concierge medicine. Right. I'd love to see it happen. Um, okay. Is it time? We're doing okay. Any other questions or thoughts? Yeah. What do you think about the presidential candidates' proposals and prospects <laughs> in the next four or eight years? Yeah. One of my favorite things about all this, of course, is that. Everybody talks about one issue, the uninsured. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not here suggesting that it's good to have uninsured Americans. It's, it's, you know, it's awful. But it's one part of a complicated set of issues. And there's a reason we have 50 million uninsured, um, 47 million. And it's because health care is extremely expensive. There's some chunk of Americans who made the absolutely rational choice not to buy health care. It's too expensive. and they're pretty healthy and they don't need to buy it. There is the safety net problem of, but if they get into a car accident, they know that the government's going to bail them out because they're going to pick up the $50,000 tab of the three weeks of hospitalization that might come out of that. So that is sort of problematic. Um, I think the presidential candidates are, I don't know if John McCain even has a health plan. I've looked at both Obama and Clinton. <laughs> We hope personally he has one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> somebody like the Senate one. Uh, I don't know if he has one for the country. Um, and I think that uh, at the end of the day, most of the health insurance experts I talk to suggest that Clinton's plan is a little bit more realistic in terms of getting us to where we need to go in terms of most number of people insured. But ultimately, just like Massachusetts, all of this falls apart if we can't get a grip on health care costs. Because as long as healthcare costs continue to, to be as high as they are and rise twice the rate of inflation, it becomes untenable for the government to keep um, doing bigger and bigger, bigger subsidies. It's just very difficult. So I, and I don't think either of them has, either Obama or Clinton has gotten serious about healthcare costs because they don't have to right now. They're in the campaign phase. Why would they get serious about how to, to so they both talk about containing costs. But you know, sort of to me, it's like, Sure, we all want to contain costs, we all want to improve quality, we all want to improve access. How on earth do you actually do it? And I don't think either of them has talked seriously about that. How do you actually do it? How do you actually <laughs> do it? <laughs> oh, man. Um, 
The title of the talk today is not containing healthcare costs. Um, so I do think that in the longer run, things like electronic health records are going to be very, very helpful. There is a ton of, of waste in the healthcare system, a ton of duplication of stuff that will get better with better information. Um, I think payers have to start paying more for outcomes and less for individual things. So instead of saying, you'll get more if you do four more tests, it's just you get a certain amount of money to manage this patient. But yeah, it creates that tension that I talked about. Um, that, uh, you know, and then there is a lot of, there's this whole movement now, somebody, uh, what's called comparative effectiveness, which is, okay, so you got, you got a guy who's had six months of low back pain, okay? Disabling low back pain. The MRI doesn't show any major problems. What do you do? Well, depends on, if you live in Boston versus New Haven versus New York City, you're going to get dramatically different therapies because it's whatever the local surgeons think you ought to do. And you see eight 12-fold differences in rates of back surgery in towns right next to each other with identical patient populations because one town has a back surgeon and the other has two back surgeons and the other town has one back surgeon. And everybody's got to be fully employed, right? Um, so it's payers starting to, to take much more of an active role in saying, we're just not going to pay for the back surgery for which there's good data. This is not going to help the patient. But payers have not wanted to get into that because you can imagine the politics of it gets very, very complicated. Um, Gene's point that we cease being rational about this stuff. Until yeah, I've had six months of back pain and my insurance company won't pay for my back surgery. This is an outrage. Even though I can convincingly tell you that back surgery is not going to help you, doesn't matter. It still feels like an outrage and people are not. And, and well, there was that whole thing with Cigna with the young woman and the operation that they proved at the last minute, but basically Too late. the clinical evidence was yeah, and you know, that she was only going to get a couple more months of life anyway. Right. And, you know, it's a, it is a complicated set of issues. I mean, there was a whole thing in the 90s around bone marrow transplant for breast cancer. And we were, and you know, insurance companies said this stuff is experimental. And you can imagine the 38-year-old woman who's got metastatic breast cancer. She's got three small kids at home. Her only chance of surviving is a bone marrow transplant. And the big, mean old insurance company says, no, experimental. Well, you can imagine how well that goes over politically. It's a disaster. And so insurance companies just all just lied down and said, fine, we'll pay for all of this stuff. But part of the until Let me just finish. Until somebody did a good randomized control trial that showed that it didn't work. But part of the answer to your question is that the, the amount of money that's spent out of the $2.1 trillion in the last six months of life is shockingly high. And if you count uh, the amount of money that's not spent in the first 30 years of life on things that would potentially increase, keep people well and completely out of the insurance and the healthcare system, it's even scarier. So the... Right. It's not uh, even counting the mal the maldistribution disease. issue in terms of the way the incentives are set up, be it single payer or not, right. insurance are phenomenal. The question is, how do you, in, in real terms, start fixing this? And there are two thoughts. I mean, one is um, that you know a lot of my uh, folks at Dartmouth have done all the really good work on the payments of the last two years of life stuff. And I'm good friends with them. They're terrific people. I always remind them, I, as a doctor, don't always know what the last two years of life is. And sometimes you do, but you don't always know when, uh, when the, this is the terminal event. So it's always post hoc analysis that they do. Someone's died, then they look in the last six months. OK. If I had that sort of clarity of vision as a clinician, my life would be a whole lot easier. I don't. The second problem is there is a huge issue around expectations and management of people at the end of life. You know, patients come in, they're very sick, families have not grappled with the fact that this patient has a terminal disease and is going to die, and they, and they want the patient to go to the ICU. And it's very hard for me as a doctor to say, no, I will not, I'm going to have the patient die right here in the emergency room. I generally can't do that. I'm not laying that no, at your I feet. Don't, no, no, I'm not right. I'm, I'm not. It's a cultural issue. And so it's very hard to, so from a policy point of view, how do you begin to fix this stuff? Well, you've got to educate the American public. Good luck. You know? Change people's expectations about healthcare. Terrific. I mean, these are great platitudes, but how do we actually do it? Very, very difficult. What? You know, the more um, the the people on the right would argue, whether it's the first 30 years of life or the last couple of years of your life, at the end of the day, you know, people have 
people have to take personal responsibility. I spend a lot of time thinking about what do my what do my kids need not need in terms of healthcare and vaccinations and all that stuff. Personal responsibility. Uh, and the second thing is the reason we spend so much money at the end of life. Part of it is because no one, the people who are paying for it, is the you know, government's paying for it. And if individuals actually had to pay more of it, they would think about: Is this valuable? Do I want to bankrupt my family for something that's completely useless? But those are very hard issues to talk about. And you know, and you, do you want your 85-year-old grandmother making the decision of, no, I think I will die because I don't want to bankrupt my family? That stuff is not the kind of conversation that we in America have been willing and open to having. And we just say, no, 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 just pay for it. You're rational. You know, it's sort of like the old thing of like, uh, you know, people talk about why does healthcare reform not ever come to be, even though every five, 10 years we talk about it. And the argument is because the status quo is everybody's favorite second choice. So everybody has their first choice, single payer, please. Health savings account and, mark and consumer directed healthcare, please. Pick them. And then if you say, okay, you can't have single payer, what do you want? I'll, I'll live with status quo. And everybody arrives at status quo because it's their second favorite choice. As long as it's their second favorite choice, we don't move. Have I gotten you depressed again? <laughs> <laughs> the ending was supposed to be uplifted. <laughs> the internet will change the healthcare system. Nothing will change, yeah! <laughs> <laughs> status quo rules. <laughs> anyway, all right, that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.